And welcome back to our series, Backgammon Basics, here on Drag the Bar. I'm Bill Roberti, your instructor for the series. Now, last time in Episode 6, we looked at how to play a holding game. This episode, we're going to look at some typical doubling positions. We'll look at early doubles, we'll look at late doubles, we'll look at doubling in races, all sorts of different doubling positions. The doubling cube is the single most important part of the game in determining a winning player. And now we're going to start to see how to use it properly. Now, turning the cube works much like a raise in poker. You increase the stakes when you think you're a favorite to win. But unlike No Limit Poker, where the amount of your bet or raise is up to you, in backgammon it's limited. You can only elect to double the stake. You can't go higher than that, you can't go lower than that. If you're going to raise the stake, it has to be from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, and so on. Now, deciding just when to double takes a lot of skill and experience. You don't want to double too soon when you're just barely a favorite, but you also don't want to double too late when you become an overwhelming favorite and your opponent may have an easy drop. Ideally, you want to double when your opponent still has a take, but just by a narrow margin. Now, in practice, that means that most good doubles are made when the winning side is something like 66 to 72 percent to win. Now, you may well ask, why not double when as soon as you're a favorite? And the reason is, owning the doubling cube is a big asset. When you own it, you can double, but the other guy can't. And that means you can force him out of games that he might have won if he could have played it to the finish. Now, at the start of the game, the cube is in the middle. Neither side owns it. That means it's a little easier to make that first double because you're not giving up an asset that you possess. However, once you own the doubling cube, you don't want to give it away unless you're sure that you're giving a really good double. Not necessarily a huge pass, but just a double that's right up there around the 75% line where your opponent is indifferent to taking or passing. Now, let's talk for a second about how you decide whether to take a double. Um, often that's not as hard as the doubling decision itself. The rule is that you can take a double if you can win the game one time in four, which is 25%. Now, a lot of people, when they first hear this, find this somewhat surprising. Um, if you're an underdog, why not just drop? Why play out a game that you don't have to when you're an underdog to win? So let's see exactly where this number comes from. Suppose you reach a position where you win exactly one time in four. And imagine you played this position out four different times. On average, what would happen? Well, if you played it out four times and you dropped all those doubles, you'd lose four points. That'd be your total loss. If you accept the cube at two and play the four games out, it's a little different. Three of those games, you lose two points apiece. So you lose a total of six points in the three games you lose. But then in the, in the last game, you would win, because we said you had one chance in four of winning. So you'd win that last game, and you'd win two points back. So your net loss would be six points on the three games you lost, plus two points back on the game you won for a total loss of only minus four points. And that's exactly the same as what you would have lost if you dropped all four games with the cube at one. So in practice, this 25% line is the dividing line between takes and drops. If you can do better than win 25% of the games, you should take. If you don't think you can win 25%, you should drop. Okay, now let's look at some real positions and see just what's going on. Okay, now here's our first real position set up on the board. And if you look at it, it looks pretty simple. We're right down to the very end of the game. Black owns the cube at two. You can see it right here. He's borne off 14 of his checkers. They're right here. This is the bear off tray. So he's got 14 checkers off. He's got one checker left on his six point. 
Over on the other side, white has two checkers left on his one point. So the first thing we want to notice is that everything is going to come down to this last roll. If black is able to bear off this checker, sorry, excuse me there. If he can bear off this checker, he'll win. If he can't bear it off, white will take his last two checkers off no matter what roll he throws next time, and white will win in that case. So black is thinking about doubling, and he wants to know well, just how big a favorite am I in this position. Clearly, most of his rolls are going to bear off that checker but a few of them aren't, and he wants to know exactly how big a favorite he is. Now, we can do that by what's called just counting rolls. Um, we're going to take a look at how many rolls bear off against how many total rolls he has and see what kind of a percentage favorite black really is. Now, before we get started, we need to mention that when you roll two dice, Let's take a look at a black roll here. We'll stick two dice out here. When you roll two dice, uh, there's a total of 36 different possibilities that can come up on the dice. With the first die, it can roll uh, six different numbers. And with the second die, you can also roll six different numbers. So you multiply those two together, six times six, you get a total of 36 different possibilities for the two numbers on the dice. And what we want to know is how many of those 36 possibilities win the game for black and how many don't. Now, when you count those 36 numbers, well, here's one thing to remember. Let's take a look at this one. If you roll a double, there's only one way that can happen. You need to roll, for instance, for double fours, you need to roll a four on the first die and you need to roll a four on the second die. So the chance of a double is one out of 36. There's only one way you can do it out of the 36 possible dice rolls. But if you roll a non-double, let's take a look at a 2-1 for instance, there's actually two different ways you can get a 2-1. Right here we've shown the way in which the first die has a 2, the second die has a 1, but there's another way to do it in which you roll a 1 on the first die and a 2 on the second. So of your 36 dice rolls, there are actually two that are the 2-1 combination. The first one, one of them has two on the first die, one on the second. The other one has one on the first die, two on the second. But they're both the same roll, 2-1. So non-doubles are twice as likely as doubles to come up. Okay, now let's look at all the different rolls here that won't win for black. Actually, it's a lot more likely that black will throw a winning number than a, a losing number. So let's make our task a little easier. We'll count the numbers that don't win first. Let's take a look at 2-1. Okay, 2-1's a loser. The checker on the 6-point only advances to the 3-point, and then white wins. So 2-1 is a loser. Remember, there's two ways to roll a 2-1. So we've got two possibilities so far. And now here's another one. 3-1 doesn't win. With 3-1, the checker gets from the 6 to the 2-point, and that's it. So 3 one's also a loser. That brings us to a total of four losing combinations. 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, and 1, 3. So we're up to four now. Then let's take a look at 4-1. Uh, that almost wins, but not quite. The checker from the six gets all the way down to the one point, but stops there. So 4, 1, and 1, 4 are losers. That brings us up to six. And then we can take a look at 3, 2. That's not going to make it. Just like with the 4-1, that's going to get the checker from the 6 down to the 1 point. So that's a loser. Now we're up to a total of 8. And are there any others? Yep, there's one more. The roll of double 1 is also a loser. That just amounts to a 4, and that gets the checker from the 6 down to the 2 point again. So black has a total of 9 losing numbers. 1-1, one, 2-1, one, 3-1, one, 4-1, one, one, and 3-2. Total is 9, and that means that all the others must win for him. So he's got to have a total of 27 winners, 9 losers. Now, if you consider there were 36 rolls possible, that means 3 quarters of his rolls win and 1 quarter lose. So black is exactly a 75% favorite in this position. 
It's very, very rare. This is actually the only one known where you can calculate the answer and say, okay, one side is exactly a 3 to 1 favorite over the other. So it's a perfect double for black. He turns the cube from 2 to 4. And for white, well, he doesn't really care if he takes it or drops it. Uh, he's got a 25% chance of winning. We discovered before that was exactly the break-even point. And if, he, if you're at the break-even point, well, it's a break-even decision. You're going to, on average, win or lose just as much by taking as by dropping. So black in this position has a perfectly effective double, and white doesn't really care if he takes or passes. Either one has the same expectation for him over time. Okay, now here's another position on the general theme of counting roles in the very, very end stages of the game. Um, once again, like the last position, it's Black's role. He owns the doubling cube at two. He's thinking about doubling, and he just wants to count his roles and see how big a favorite he is. And just like the last position, White's two checkers, White's last two checkers are on his one point. He will bear them off next turn with any roll. So the whole game comes down to whether Black can bear off these two checkers or not. If he bears them off, he wins. If he doesn't, he loses. And just like the last position, uh, to make up our mind, we have to count and see how many times out of 36 Black will bear these men off and how many times he won't bear them off. And that way that will tell us how big a favorite he is. And once again, we're going to count the rolls that miss, and in that way, it'll be the easiest and quickest way to find out how big a favorite he is overall. We'll count the rolls that miss, we'll subtract them from 36, that will tell us how many rolls bear off, and then we'll know how big a favorite black is. So let's look at some of the missing rolls. Well, it turns out that all the rolls that miss have a 1 in them. Uh, black misses if he rolls 2-1. He misses if he rolls 3-1. In fact, he misses even if he rolls 6-1. Even though he's only got five pips left and 6-1 contains seven pips, he has to play a 6 and a 1. He can't just lump these numbers together and say, oh, I rolled 7. He's got to play a 6 and a 1. So with the 6, he would bear a checker off the 3-point. Then with the 1, he'd have to move from the 2-point to the 1-point. So he misses with 2-1, 3-1, 4-1, 5-1, one, and 6-1. And that's a total of five different non-doubles, which means it's a total of ten different rolls. So ten rolls miss in that case. And as before, there's one more roll that misses. Double aces doesn't bear off these two checkers. It bears off the guy on the two point, but then the guy on the three just moves down to the one. So that's the eleventh roll. It turns out that a total of eleven rolls won't bear off black's last two checkers. If we subtract 11 from 36, we realize, okay, there's that, that must mean there's 25 rolls that do bear off both checkers. So black is a 25 to 11 favorite. If you can do the math in your head, that makes him roughly 70% to win. Well, 70% is certainly good enough to double. Black's a big favorite. He's going to win this position most of the time. But white wins it 30% of the time. So white easily has enough to take. And that means the correct cube action in this position is for black to double and for white to take the cube at four. And then there's just one more roll left. Black shoots, and he either wins or he loses. Uh, he'll either win four points or white will win four points. Now, here's an example that's a little closer than the ones we've just been looking at. This time, uh, as before, black has two men left and so does white. And as before, we know that white will bear off if he gets a chance to roll. But now, black's checkers, instead of being well positioned, they're actually on the five point and the two point. And now, at first, it's not so clear. Is, is black even a favorite or not here? Well, it turns out, if, let, let's count the rolls and see just how often he does bear off. Um, We'll do them systematically, uh, kind of in order. We can see that black wins if he rolls 6-5, or 6-4, or 6-3, or 
He can't roll 6, 1 because he'll miss when he rolls the 1. But 6, 5, 6, 4, 6, 3, 6, 2 will bear off. So there's four different non-doubles, and that's a total of eight rolls. Now there's also 5, 4, 5, 3, and 5, 2, which will bear off. And that's a total of three more non-doubles or six more rolls. So he's up to 14 rolls that bear off. And then we have to count the doubles. And obviously black will win if he rolls 6-6 six, six, or 5-5 five, five, or 4-4 four, four, or 3-3. Three, three. And in fact, even 2-2 two, two will win. With 2-2, two, two, he can go from the 5 point to the 1 point. Then he can take the last two checkers off. So there's five of his doubles that also bear his men off. And that means his total winning chances are 14 with the non-doubles, five more with the doubles. That's a total of 19 winning rolls. And if there's 36 rolls possible and there's 19 winners, that means there have to be 17 losers. So black is a very, very slight favorite in this position, 19 to 17 really, just about 53%. But since it's the last roll of the game and there's no more action after this, black can still double. His correct decision is to double to four. And white, since white's going to win this about 47% of the time, has an easy, easy take. So this is a narrow double and an easy take. And finally, here's a position that's a close relative of the last one. Instead of having his two checkers on the five and the two points, black's got them on the four and the three points. Now his pip count's the same. It was seven in the last position, it's seven in this one. But the exact location actually matters. It's not just a matter of pip count. If we count black's winning rolls in this position, we're only going to come up with 17. He can win if he rolls 6-5, six, 6-4, six, or 6-3, or 5-4, or 5-3, that's a total of 10, or 4-3, that's a total of 12, plus five of the doubles, just like before. That takes us up to 17. So black wins with 17 here, but he loses with the other 19. And that means in this position, he's a slight underdog. And if he didn't know that and doubled here, put the cube on white side at four, white could exercise a little option that you don't see too often, but you can do it. If your opponent doubles you, and you think he's made an incorrect double, and you're actually the favorite in the position, you don't have to just accept the cube at that level. You can do what's called beavering and turn the cube one more notch and keep it on your side. So if black were to double this from two to four, white's correct action would be not just to accept the cube at four, but to beaver it to eight. And now he would own an eight cube, and of course the game would end on the next turn. Either black would win eight or white would win eight, but white's a favorite, so he's happy to have eight points decide the game and not just four. Okay, now here's a different kind of doubling problem. Again, we're down toward the end of the game. Uh, this time black has eight checkers on his one and two points, and white has eight checkers on his one and two points. And we call this a four roll position. Now, by four roll position, what we mean is uh, if black doesn't roll a double, he'll be off in four rolls. The first roll will take these two men off, the next roll will take off these two, and so on. It'll take him exactly four rolls, barring a double, to get those men off. And the same is true of white. So if white doesn't throw a double, he's going to lose, because black is always going to be ahead of him bearing men off. And in fact, white's going to have just three shots to roll that double. Uh, he's going to have one shot after black takes off the first two men. If he misses that, we get down to this position. Then uh, black takes off two more men. Then he has another shot. And if he misses that one, black takes off two more men. And he has one last chance to roll a double. So in a four-roll position, white actually has three chances to roll a double that will turn the game around. Otherwise, he loses. Now... As it happens, a four-roll position is a double and a take. Uh, black is about a little over 75% to win. The fact that white has three chances to roll a double is where he gets that 25% plus equity from. 
But this is a very standard position. It's one that you sort of need to know. Uh, a lot of bear offs will come down to something like this. And what you want to remember is the four roll position. And, by, and notice in a four roll position, by the way, that no one can miss. That's very important. Um, this, for example, is not a four roll position because white could, or black could roll a two at any stage and lose a whole turn. So in a, in a true four roll position, you've got to have eight checkers left or maybe seven, and you've got to be able to get two men off with all your non-doubles. In that case, you're in a, a real four roll position. Uh, the side on roll is a little less than 75% to win, and it's a good double and a good take. Now here we get to a variation on that idea. In this position, each side has six checkers left, black and white. Black is on roll, and we call this, as you might expect, a three roll position. Black is going to be off in three rolls if he doesn't throw a double, so is white. And now here, if black doubles here and white takes, black has only, or sorry, white has only two chances to roll a double and turn the game around. Otherwise, black will just bear all his men off and win. And this position is about an 80-20 favorite for black. Um, black's about 80% to win here. Two rolls just isn't enough time to throw a double. You, you don't have enough chance. You've only got one chance in six to roll a double on any turn. So trying to roll a double in two turns still doesn't give you very many chances. So this position is actually a double for black and a pass for white. And that's a little factoid you just kind of want to stick in your brain. A four roll position is double take. A three roll position on the other hand is double pass. Now here's another very basic very important kind of doubling position. Again this comes up an awful lot and we call this kind of position a straight race. Basically nothing is going on here except this, the two sides are racing home they're trying to bear off their men quickly when they do and whoever bears off first wins and nobody's going to hit a shot here and nobody's going to get a man sent back behind a prime. There is a tiny bit of contact here if you'll notice uh, Black's 13 point is still in contact with White's midpoint. So it's theoretically possible if Black rolled nothing but 6-1 for several turns that he could leave a shot but in reality that's just not going to happen. Um, so this is a straight race and all that this depends on really is what we call the pip count. And the pip count just means the amount of numbers, the amount of pips you have to roll on the dice in order to finally bear off all your checkers by an exact count. For example, if, if Black rolls 5-4 here, he's thrown 9 pips. He's advanced his checkers nine pips in the race, and he's going to just keep rolling and keep doing that, and whoever gets their men off first wins. And the way we analyze these kind of positions is we look at black's pip count, and then we look at white's pip count, and we compare them. And if black is far enough ahead, then it's double pass. And if he's not very far ahead at all, it's not a double. And in the middle, there's a little sweet spot where it'll be a good double for black and a good take for white. So let's start off. We're going to actually compute uh, what black's pip count is in this position. And we'll do this in a very straightforward way. Um, we're just going to add up the number of pips on each point and add them all together and then when we get to the end we'll, fit, we'll, we'll know how many pips black needs to roll to bear off his men. Now let's start here with the midpoint. Uh, it's black's 13 point. Black has two checkers there. So these represent 26 pips. Black has to throw a total of 26 pips on the dice in order to eventually get these checkers off. That's a minimum. He might have to roll a little more because he might not be able to get them off by an exact count. But 26 pips is the pip count for these two checkers. Okay, then we come down here to Black's 8 point. He's got two checkers there. That represents 16 pips. If we add that into the 26 represented by the midpoint, we're up to 42. 
Then we go on to the seven point. He's got two checkers worth a total of 14 pips. Add those into the 42, we get to 56. Three checkers here on the six point is another 18. That takes us to 74. Three checkers on the five point is 15. That takes us to 89. Two checkers on the four point amounts to eight pips. So that takes us to 97. And finally, one last checker on the three point. That's three pips, and we add that to the 97, and we get a final pip count for black of 100 pips. That means at the very least, in order to bear off all his checkers, black has to throw a total of 100 pips on the, di on the, on the two dice. Then we do the same thing for white. Now, I won't work. you can work through this on your own if you want. You do it exactly the same way. This is white's four point, white's five point, white's six point, white's midpoint is his 13 point. You can go through that whole process, add them up. If you do, I'll, I'll take a shortcut here, I'll just tell you, you'll find a pip count for white of 118 pips. So black is 100, white's 118, and we compute the difference as a percentage based on the leader's pip count. Uh, Black's up 18 pips. His pip count was 100, so he's up 18% in the race. And that's the number we really want to look at when we're dealing with races. What's the percentage lead for the fellow that's on roll? Now, all of this has been reduced to formulas, solved by computer and stuff like that. So I'll tell you, 18 pips is too much of a lead. Uh, in this position, Black should double and white should pass because he's too far behind. The magic numbers for races, there's three numbers you want to remember. 8%, 9%, and 12%. If black is ahead at least 8%, it's okay for him to double if the cube is in the middle. If black is up 9%, only 1% more, it's okay for him to double if he owns the cube. He requires a little bigger edge to double if he owns the cube because owning the cube is an asset, it's worth something, and you want a bigger advantage in the game in order to double. And finally, if black is up more than 12%, white should pass the double. He, white has a 25% a chance of coming from behind and winning if he gets double and he's only down about 12% in the race. But if he's down more than that, he's less than 25% to win the game, and he should give up. Now, here we found out he was down 18%. The pip count was 100 to 118. That's an 18% lead for black when black is on roll. That's a big pass. Um, he's actually well over, black is well over 80% to win this position. So in straight races, there are three numbers you want to remember, 8%, 9%, 12%. Once you do a pip count, you compare the two pip counts. If the side on roll is ahead by at least 8%, he has a double from the center. If he's ahead at least 9%, he has a redouble if he owns the cube. And if he's ahead more than 12%, then the other fellow should give up. It's a very useful rule. Since these positions are pretty common, it's going to help you out a lot. Now here's another example of a straight race. Uh, here there isn't even a trace of contact left. There's no theoretical way that anyone could hit anyone else. Um, and once again, uh, this time black owns the cube, so we know he needs to be a little bit bigger favorite than just a bare 8% in order to double. So once again we'll compute the pip counts and we'll compare them and we'll see what the cube action should be. Now I'll make it a little quick for you. I'll tell you what the pip counts are and then we'll go back later and take a look at how you can compute them a little more easily yourself. Uh, black's pip count is 90 and white's, white's pip count is 100. So black is leading by 10 pips and his pip count is 90 so as a percentage his lead is 10 divided by 90, which is 1 ninth, which is just a little over 11%. Now, on our formula, we know that 11% is an easy double for black. He needs to be more than 9% ahead to redouble, and he is. He's 11% ahead, so it's a redouble for black. 
And from White's point of view, he's only down 11%. And we know that if he, as long as he's not down more than 12%, he can take. So this position is a double for black and a take for white. Now, before we leave it, um, let's say a little bit more about pip counting, because it may seem a little arduous here to, to have to add up all these pips. Of course, when you, when you play online or when you play against a computer program, the, uh, the online site or the bot is keeping track of your pip count itself, and it will always display it for you just to make life easier. But if you go to real tournaments or if you play cash games in a club against people for real money, um, there's no bot around to tell you what the pip count is. So you do need to know it for these kinds of races because they come up a lot and understanding this little formula is very powerful, but you need to be able to do it when you're at the board. Uh, good players can do a pip count in literally seconds with an extremely high level of accuracy. And that's one thing that gives them an edge when they play tournaments or cash games in that whenever one of these racing positions come up, uh, a top-notch player can just compute the pip count on the spot very quickly. And a less experienced player or a lazy player, whatever, won't do it. And they'll make a lot of mistakes because they don't know what the count is. They can't apply the formula in these positions. And as a result, they just guess. And a lot of times they guess wrong. Now, in the last problem, I showed you kind of the long way of counting pips, going point by point by point. Here, I'll, I'll show you a couple of shortcuts. Um, let's take a look at Black's position first, for example. Um, one shortcut you can take is I'm going to look only at the points where Black has two checkers. And I'm going to ignore these odd single checkers for a while. So let me just remove them for a second. And let's take a look just at the points where black has two checkers. Now, notice he has two on the four, two on the five, two on the six, two on the seven, two on the eight. What I'm going to do to count these 10 checkers is I'm going to add these numbers together, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four and five is nine, and six is 15, and seven is 22, and eight's 30. And then I'm going to double it because we have two checkers on each of these points, not just one. So I got the 30, I'll double it, I'll get the, I get the 60, and 60 is the sum for these 10 checkers. Now that's pretty fast. You can actually do that in just seconds. If you focus on the points that have just two checkers, add up the numbers of all those points, and then double it. You've counted a lot of checkers very quickly. Then we can restore our single checkers and count those individually. So I know these 10 amounted to 60. And then this checker here on the 10 point makes it 70. And this makes it 79. And this 6 is 85. And this 3 is 88. And 2 more is 90. So once again, I get the 90 that I had for this whole formation. And there's one even easier method. Uh, this one takes a little bit of alertness. Notice that Black's position is totally symmetrical. Uh, in fact, it's symmetrical around the six point. Black has just as many checkers on this side of the six point as he has on this side. Well, if they're symmetrical, that means that this whole formation is going to have the same pip count as a formation that had all 15 checkers piled up on the 6. And therefore, its pip count is going to be 15 times 6, which is 90. So there's all these little tricks you can do that let you count the pips a little faster. But it's a crucial skill for playing live tournaments or live cash games. And it's one that you really need to work at. Now, here's another a totally different kind of position where, again, you need to know a few rules about doubling. Uh, but if you know them, you can get the right answer in a lot of different positions. Uh, this is an example of an early blitz. What happened here is that White won the opening roll with a 6-4, and he ran this checker from the 1 point out here to the 11. And then Black rolled double fives, and we've seen an example of this a couple of times before. He moved two checkers from his 8 point to his 3, two checkers from his 6 down to his 1, and on the 1 point he hit the white blot that was there, put it on the bar. And then white danced. And now black is thinking about doubling, 
because he's got a chance if he can hit this checker to launch a blitz and close white out completely and in fact in one of our earlier lessons we saw an example of how that game plan was carried through from start to finish but now we want to look at the doubling situation here and these positions are pretty well understood um, this position is a double for black and a take for white now the hard part is the double the double is actually very, there's very little difference here between doubling and not doubling. Black only gains a little when he makes the correct play of a double, but it's correct nonetheless. And the take is very, very easy. It would be a terrible blunder for white to drop here because white actually has a very good chance of getting in at some point and consolidating his game. The, the blitz comes up. You will win some, some gammons here. We've seen it done but you really only get, win a gammon here a little over 30 percent of the time the rest of the time white comes in gets a position and puts up a fight so this kind of early double five blitz these are double and take and it doesn't really matter where this checker is for example if black had run out if white had run out with a six three and gotten there or a six two and gotten there it doesn't really matter they're all doubles they're all takes Now, here's a little different kind of an early blitz. <clears throat> this time, white split his, bla his back checkers with a four and played the three down to there on his opening roll. And then black rolled double threes. And he played that by making his five point and making his three point. And then white danced. And now again, black is thinking about a double. Well, this is also double take. But this double is much stronger than the previous double, the, the double five position that we looked at. And the reason it's so much stronger is because black isn't committed to playing this as some sort of blitz, which would involve making points deep in his board. Instead, he's built a very strong position for any kind of game that comes up. He's made his five point, he's made his three point. He might turn this into a prime, for example, if he rolled a number like 4-2, he'd be starting to build a priming game. Uh, he can win this in a positional way, or if the dice allow it, he can win it as a blitz as well. He might be able to make a closeout from here. Uh, if his next roll, for example, is double fours, he might elect to play double fours by switching from the five to the one point and then bringing down a couple of builders and turning it into a real blitz. So he has options from that position, very strong options. And that's a double and it's a take, but the double is very strong. And it's the take that's the hard part of that decision. OK, now let's move on a bit and take a look at some somewhat more interesting positions from the middle game and see how we might think about these in terms of doubling and taking. Now, our first position here, we've gone probably eight or ten moves into the game um, both sides have started to set up positions black's a little bit ahead in, in things uh, notice that black has a few points made in his board here he's got a little bit of a block on white's rear checkers black's distributed his men well he's covering all the quadrants he's got a little bit of an advanced anchor here he's moved up one pip from the 24 point so black is, is doing okay in this position and white clearly is not doing quite as well he's got more men back he hasn't got as good a block he's got a stack of checkers here on uh, his own six point so uh, black who's on roll is justifiably thinking about doubling and of course if, if white gets doubled he's gonna have to decide whether he wants to take or not so let's start off and, and ask ourselves the question, how do we think about this position if we're in black shoes? What, what do we look for that tells us that we probably have a double in a position like this? And the criteria I like to use are basically three. Um, first criteria is the race. How are we doing in the race? I like being ahead. The further ahead I am, the better I like it. Second criteria is position. Who's got the better position? Who's got more blocking points? Who's got a better anchor? Who's doing well in, in that context? And then finally, I want to look at threats. 
if I'm the doubler, I like it. To, I like to have threats. I like to be threatening to build new points, to build a prime, to extend a prime, or just to hit some loose blots that may be lying around the board. And my general rule of thumb in these sorts of middle game positions is that if I'm ahead in two out of three of these areas, I probably have a double. And whether it's a take or not, well, that's not Black's problem right now. So let's look at this from Black's point of view and see if we think that he's doing well enough for a double. Now, first of all, the race. Um, we can do a pip count like I've described before. I'm going to just tell you what the result is if you did a pip count here. Uh, Black's pip count is 133 and White's pip count is 149. And chiefly White's behind because he has an extra man back in Black's home board. That's really where the, the whole race difference comes from. So, okay, Black's doing well in the race. He's up 16 pips. That's a good number. Now, second criteria is position. And in terms of position, again, Black's a little bit ahead. He's got more blocking points. He's got a smoother position. He doesn't have any big stacks. White doesn't have as many blocking points, and he does have one big stack here. So as far as position goes, black is also ahead by a bit. Then our, our last criteria are threats. And to evaluate threats, we just look at really what, is, is there anything we're threatening on doing that's going to tip the balance one way or the other here? And if you look at this position, uh, black has a number of threats. For example, uh, any two that he rolls, is going to let him hit this checker, send that checker all the way back. So he's going to gain a ton in the race if that happens. And besides that, he's got a few rolls that make the bar point here and give him a better prime. For example, if his next roll is 6-1, well, then he'd take the checker on the 13, the checker on the 8, and he'd make the 7 point. So he's now extended his prime to a full 5-point prime. That's a really big edge. Uh, same way if he rolled something like 3-1. Uh, 3-1 one. One lets him move the checker on the 10, checker on the 8, and make the 7 point. So he's got several rolls that will make the 7 point. And notice none of those rolls involve a 2. So they're just a bonus over and above the fact that his 2s hit this checker. So the answer to the question is, does he have threats? Is yes. He's got some good solid threats that could turn this position around a little bit. So our, our rule of thumb was going to be if you were ahead in two out of three of the various areas, the race, the position, the threats, then you probably had a good double. And in this case, Black's ahead in all three areas. He's, he's got a lead in the race by 16 pips. He's got a better position here. And he's got a few threats. So this is clearly a good double for Black. So let's assume he takes the cube and sticks it up there. Now, what about white? Uh, can white think about taking this, or, or does he just have to give up? And when I'm thinking about taking, I'm really using different criteria. I, I accept the fact that I'm going to be well behind in the game. After all, that's why my opponent is doubling me, because he, he thinks he's something like a 70 or 75% favorite. So when I'm thinking about taking, I, I figure I'm going to be behind in all these criteria. But that's okay, because what I want to know is, can I pull this position out a quarter of the time? And really what I look for here is, uh, do I have an anchor? And the answer is yes, white has an anchor, and that's good because it means he, he can't get closed out. Um, am I behind a full prime or a five-point prime yet? And the answer is no, which is okay too, because it means I've got some chance of wiggling out here. And the last thing I want to look at is, am I restraining some of my opponent's checkers? And again, the answer is yes. These two checkers here, the black checkers on the 23 point, they, they don't have to get out anytime soon. They can run into some difficulty. And white can still build up this position if he gets a little lucky. So all those things taken together say to me, as white, I have counterplay here. I'm not getting crushed. I have an anchor. I'm not primed yet. And I've got some chances of restraining these, these back checkers that haven't escaped. So as white, I'm going to take this position. And that's basically how we would go through the analysis for a, a middle game like this. 
Um, black has an edge in several areas. That's reason enough to double. But white's not getting crushed yet, so that's reason enough to take. Okay, now let's apply our same criteria to this position. Uh, once again, black on roll. Black is thinking about doubling. And let's look at this and see how he stacks up on our three doubling criteria. The race, the position, and the threats. Now, in terms of the race, he's doing very, very well. His, his pip count is actually 134, and White's is 162. So Black is up 28 pips in the race. That's a big lead, much bigger than he had in the last position. So the race, that's a solid edge for Black. Then we move on to position. And again, Black has the edge in position here. He's got four points here that block in the white checkers in the rear. Uh, he hasn't filled these in yet, but he's still got four, which is more than white has. White only has three. So in terms of position, we'll give Black a small edge here. And then lastly, we look at threats. Now, threats, the truth is Black really doesn't have a whole lot in the way of threats. Um, he's threatening maybe to roll a 6-1, which would let him make his five point. That would be a nice improvement. Um, he's threatening to roll a number like 5-4. Uh, that's, that's a little bit of a threat. Threatens to get this checker out, which is nice. But because white has no blots anywhere, these are not the kind of really strong threats we saw in the last position. So we'll give Black two out of three here. He has a big lead in the race, which is nice. He has a somewhat better position, which is good. Doesn't really have any threats, but two out of three is good enough. Black can double this. Now, to decide if White should take... Oh, I'm sorry, the cube, by the way, was should have been in the center through that whole discussion. Now we discover that, indeed, Black is going to double. Now let's look at White and decide if he wants to take or not. And again, we're going to look at, um, is white trapped behind a prime? Well, not really. He can still wiggle out. These points aren't made yet. They may not get made anytime soon. So he's not really trapped behind a prime yet. Um, black doesn't have crushing threats that he has to worry about. And does he have contact? Can he restrain some black checkers that haven't escaped yet? And the answer is, yeah, he's got some contact. This checker may not get out. Uh, White might be able to do things like this in the future, start to make up a prime. So he's, he's not crushed. He has chances of getting out. He has chances of restraining this checker. There aren't any real strong threats for Black at this point. So once again, we can say this is a pretty good take for White. So double here for black because he's got two out of three of the doubling criteria. He's got the race, he's got the position, but no threats. And not a terribly hard take for white because he's not getting crushed. He still has wiggle room. He still has an anchor. He's doing okay. So double for black and take for white. Okay, so let's, let's uh, review here just what we learned in this lesson. This is our, really our first lesson all about doubling. Um, we learned how to count rolls. We learned there are 36 possible rolls, and when you get down toward the end of the game, sometimes you make your du doubling decisions based just upon how many rolls will get you off and how many won't. So we took a look at how to count rolls in that case. We took a look at three and four roll positions. We learned that... Uh, if you're in a three-roll position, that's double pass. If you're in a four-roll position, that's double take. And, of course, those are positions where all your checkers are jammed down to the one and two points, so you can't really miss anymore. Uh, every roll is going to take off at least two checkers. Then we, uh, we looked at some racing positions. We learned how to count pips. We learned about our 8-9-12 rule for evaluating doubles in pure races. Uh, if the side that's thinking about doubling is ahead by 8%, he can double from the middle. If he's up by 9%, he can redouble if he, if he owns the cube. And as long as the other side isn't down by more than 12%, he has a take. And then finally, we looked at some middle game positions, and we saw how uh, we can look at three key factors, the, um, the race, the position, and the threats. 
And by putting those together, looking for an edge in two out of three, uh, we learned that that's usually good enough to, to make a middle game double. And in terms of taking, you're really trying to make sure you're not crushed yet. Uh, you don't have a lot of checkers up on the bar. You've got some kind of position. You've got an anchor. Your opponent hasn't primed you yet. If all of those things are true, then a take is usually a good idea. Now in our next episode, which will really wrap up the, the Backgammon Basics series, we'll take a look at a long, complicated game between a couple of world-class players. We'll see it go through a lot of different kinds of positions, and there'll be a lot of interesting plays. And it will serve as a good introduction to sort of world-class backgammon as it's really played in high-level tournaments. And remember, if you want to play online backgammon, try the site Black Chip Poker, which is part of the Merge Network. They accept American players, and you can sign up through the My Account page here on Drag the Bar. And by all means, remember to sign up for Rakeback when you join. Okay, until then, this is Bill Roberti signing off for Drag the Bar.